Hey friends, it's so good to be with you, whether you're joining us online or listening to us at Super Talk FM, we are glad that you are here. Today we're beginning a new sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. And maybe you grew up in a church that said a creed, a statement of faith every Sunday, or you've never even heard what I'm talking about. Well, hopefully this sermon series will speak to both of you as we come together to make an understanding of our statement of faith. This we believe. Now, today is also a special day in that in our in-person services here at First United Methodist Church, we are confirming our students, our sixth graders who have been preparing to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and confirm their faith, saying, yes, this is what we believe. And so if you're watching us online or listening to us, you can also visit our Facebook page or our church website and watch those services, uh, both at 9 and 11 from the, this Sunday, to see these young people make their profession of faith. It's a great day. And so thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you do understand you're welcome no matter where you are and no matter where you've been on this journey, because we believe that together we can know more and grow more in God and Jesus. Thanks for being with us. The chimes of time ring out the news Another day is through Someone slipped and fell Was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength Your courage to renew Do not be disheartened for I bring hope to you. It is no secret what God can do, what He's done for us. Just take him at his promise, don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others. Join me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, then we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Ascended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe. In God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in the life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth, I believe in the saints communion, and in your holy church, I believe in the resurrection, when Jesus comes again, oh I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in the name
Hey friends, every time I think of the offering, I like to think of individual people that are impacted by what you give. Today's an easy day for me because in our in-person services, we are confirming, uh, I think, 12 young adults who are saying yes to following Jesus. And because of your generosity, we have a place here where they can grow to learn more about Jesus. Not just as children, but now as they're beginning that journey into the youth group and into young adulthood, your gifts provide places and people for them to know more about Jesus. So don't ever forget, when you give, the impact in other people's lives and faith that you're making. So please feel free to give generously. You can do that online right now at firstmethodistclinton.org slash giving. You can mail your check to 100 Mount Salus or drop it off at the church the next time you're in the neighborhood. Thank you for your giving. And remember, it truly does make an eternal difference. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're joining us today. I'm Miss Nikki, and we're going to have a few moments for the kids. Did you know that today is Confirmation Sunday? Our sixth graders have been learning so much more about their faith and the church. So let's talk a little bit about that. Confirmation actually has several different meanings. We usually think of it in terms of science, like when you do an experiment to be sure of something. You might have tested a hypothesis, which is an idea about the way something works. You confirm a theory. But how do we confirm the love of God? How can we confirm a belief? Jesus said God was his Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, and that God loves us no matter what, no matter how much we mess up. How can we ever confirm that? What we have are not tests of faith, like in science, but we have the Bible, which contains stories or testimonies of faith. Testimonies are stories told by people about what happened to them and what they saw and heard and felt and believed. Matthew wrote the first book of the New Testament, which is a book of testimonies about Jesus and the early church. Matthew's Gospel tells the good news of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus talks about doing what he told us to do because it would be the best foundation to build our lives upon. He said, Everyone who then hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and they beat on that house. And as it fell, there was a great fall. I was thinking that maybe we could test this hypothesis of Jesus here today, but we would need rock and sand and things we need to build a house to be able to do that. And then we need some rain and flood waters. But I thought maybe if Jesus had some frozen waffles to use an example to test this hypothesis, he might have used them instead of sand, something you would not want to use as the foundation of your house. It kind of looks like a block, doesn't it? It's pretty solid. It's frozen. What do you think? Would waffles make a good house? I bet they're not as strong as rock, and they don't stay frozen, right? They get all soggy and flimsy and fall apart. Like sand, they change with the weather. They wouldn't do so well if they get wet either. What about Legos? Have you ever built a house made out of Legos? Do you think this one small piece is good enough to use as my foundation? I don't think it would get very tall. So what's gonna happen when it gets really tall? It's gonna fall over, right? So building my tower on one block is kind of like building my house on the sand. It's not a very good foundation, and it's not going to last us a long time. Now, my house isn't built on a firm foundation, like rock, or if we take shortcuts, like adding this waffle in here to make it taller, it's going to fall over, right? Oh, there it goes. Not very good, is it? Maybe we should try building our tower again, but make it wider on the bottom this time. Make it stronger, and we'll see how high we can go. So here I have a big block, and I'm adding more pieces to it. Oh, look, look, there we go. Look at that. We don't want our confirmant to doubt their faith in God or fall down when things get difficult. We want them to be strong, like a rock, like the Word of God in the Bible. What Jesus says is that we can stand confidently in what's inside the Bible, the promises of God. They are strong and firm and will stand up to any kind of weather. 
That's what Jesus promises. And that's what we can pray for our confirmants today. They can't confirm their faith through science or waffles or Legos, but God can confirm their faith by making it stronger because we know that all their lives their faith will be tested, rain and winds of troubles will come and try to shake their beliefs. So let's pray for them today for their confirmation. Dear God, we pray that you will keep the faith of our confirmants rock solid strong, like a good foundation for their whole lives. We are praying for the Holy Spirit to come into their lives with power so that you will never let their faith falter. We're praying for Jesus to keep his promise, the one he gave to his disciples at the very end of Matthew's gospel. It says in Matthew 28, verse 20, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. In your name we pray, amen. Won't you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There was a legend that circulated in the early church that a few days after the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples at Pentecost, that the disciples were sitting around the table together, and Peter spoke up and said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then Andrew, sitting next to him, said, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And then each of the now 12 disciples added one line to what became known as the Apostles' Creed. That's a lovely and completely untrue story. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. What we call the Apostles' Creed, this statement of faith that uh, we Methodist and other similar type Christians recite during our worship services, is a statement of faith that is called the Apostles' Creed, not because it was written by the Apostles, but because we believe it reflects the apostolic faith, the faith that has held the church together since the days of the Apostles. It's a statement of belief, a statement of our core fundamental understanding of who God is and what we believe in response to what God has revealed. And so, we are studying together over the next several weeks the Apostles' Creed, line by line, to help us understand what it is we believe when we say these words together, and hopefully to help us understand how each of these individual statements of faith really do help to shape who we are as the people of God. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of an orientation around understanding the Apostles' Creed, and then we're going to dive in together on the first line. Now, the Apostles' Creed is carefully structured around the Trinity. In fact, there are three big sections. A section on the Father, a section on the Son, and a section on the Holy Spirit. In fact, this creed was first written as a baptismal question and answer format. Uh, candidates for baptism that were about to join the church, they would be asked, do you believe in God the Father? And they would respond, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. They'd be asked, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they would say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Then they would be asked, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And they would say, yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so each section of the Apostles' Creed is really divided into these Trinitarian sections. And then each of those three sections has a few clarifying statements, a few additional supporting sentences. And taken together, 
They reflect the core of what we as Christians believe. Now, some of you might think, if you grew up in a tradition that didn't have a creed, you might be a little suspect about a creed. But let me let you in on a little secret. Everybody has a creed. Everybody does. A creed is simply a statement of belief. What do you believe? What is the thing that guides your life? Uh, a creed is simply a statement of, of fundamental ideas, guiding principles. In fact, the word creed in our English is simply the Latin credo, for I believe. And so, you may have a creed and you're not even aware of it, but I think everybody has it. Um, some people's creeds are, I believe that whoever has the most stuff wins. Uh, some people might have the creed that uh, only the strong will survive. Your creed might believe that, uh, might simply be that uh, uh, I'm the smartest person in the world and I'm never wrong. Everyone has a creed. Everyone lives by a statement of principle. Some of us have just identified what it is and written it down. And then some of us are trying our best to lead and live by another set of principles. We're trying to live into a statement of faith. And sometimes we have better days than others. In our tradition, when we gather to say the creed, what we are saying is, this is the way that we want to live. This is the fundamental reality in which we place our beliefs, our faith. And what's also interesting is, in the church at least, when we say something like a creed, we are joining our voices together. Even when we say it alone, we use the words most often, we believe. The idea is that we are part of something larger than ourselves. We're part of a belief system that goes back thousands of years, and we believe that will continue on after our deaths. We didn't come up with this on our own. We didn't write our own statement of belief, but rather we said, this is something that I want to put my faith in. This God, this Lord, this Holy Spirit, that's where I see my true faith. And we remind ourselves of that commitment every time we say the Apostles' Creed. And so today, we begin this journey walking through this creed. And so you may have grown up saying the creed, or this may be the first time you've ever heard this, and you're still a little bit suspicious. Either way, I'm glad you're here as we journey together through this. And so we begin by making a statement of faith that we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And I want to read a bit of scripture. It's a creation story, but it comes probably not from the most familiar setting of Genesis, but it is a creation story nonetheless. And it comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. I'd like you to hear this word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. When we begin our creed, when we begin this statement of faith, we say that we believe in a God who is Father Almighty and who is the maker of heaven and earth. So that's a two-part statement about who we believe God is. We believe God is an Almighty Father, and we believe that God has created all that there is. All things that exist are the result of this God. That first statement about being an Almighty Father, that's a statement about who God is. That second part, that God is maker of heaven and earth, is about what we believe God has done. Another way to think about it is one is about His identity, one is about God's activity. 
And we say them together at the very beginning of our creed because we're making the assertion that the way that we humans know about God is because of what God has done in this creation. The only way that we really know about God is what God has chosen to reveal to us. We can't make up God on our own, or at least we don't make up a very good God when we do that. But we have come to know this God through the way this God has acted in this world. And that's where we begin our statement that we believe in a God who is an almighty Father, maker of heaven and earth. Now, I know for some people it can be complicated to call God Father. Uh, for some people, they grew up with not really good examples of fatherhood. Maybe their fathers weren't in their life, or if they were, they were real distant. They have complicated, difficult, sometimes even adversarial relationships with a father. And so to think of God as Father can be difficult for some. Uh, for others, the idea of God being um, a, a, a person that we would even think of as a father seems to be beyond uh, our rational thought. Maybe God is a spirit, a, a cloud, a force. That's maybe too much like Star Wars. <laughs> and The idea of there being a personal God that we might call father seems odd to us. Some people grew up with calling God father and it's completely normal and you don't understand why it's a big deal for others. And so I want to answer for everyone, no matter where we are in that spectrum of understanding, the reason we call God Father is for a real simple basic reason. Jesus calls God His Father. And we try to, as best we can, pattern our lives after Jesus. Jesus calls God Father, and so we are invited to call God Father. But what's also interesting is Jesus doesn't just use the formal Father. All throughout Scripture, Jesus uses a particular name. He calls God Abba. And Abba is an Aramaic word that really does have a personal meaning. Uh, in some ways, it's like calling God Daddy. Using Abba is a, a real personal, familial way. It's a term of affection, a term of, of intimate connection. Not just some distant father, but Jesus calls God Dad. And then invites us to do that as well. And we call God Father because we really do believe that the center of this universe is a God who desires a relationship with each of us. A familial fatherly relationship. It's not a God who stands distant and aloof and apart from us, but one who walks with us closely and intimately. This God desires a relationship and desires His children to call Him Father. Now, just in case we forget, it's Father Almighty, right? We still believe that God is big and powerful and, and rules over all. We believe that this God could do anything, could make anything, could destroy anything, and yet this God has desired and chosen to exercise this almighty power through a relationship of love and compassion. This is a God who is so almighty that He bends down and whispers into our ear, please, call me Abba. So we believe in God, the Father Almighty. But we also believe that this Almighty God is the maker of heaven and earth. We believe this God has done something tremendously beautiful in our midst, and that is to create this marvelous and, and vast universe that we get to see just a little part of here on this corner of God's kingdom that we call earth. But as we look out at the stars, we believe that we see the infinite expanse of God's universe. All that there is, all that there ever has been, and all that there ever will be, we believe that this Almighty God is the power behind it all. 
But then I've also noticed sometimes right here at the very beginning, the wheels come off because we get stuck then in this debate between science and faith. Uh, people want to debate how many days of creation, how many years that the world has existed. We get into debates about dinosaurs and evolution and all that stuff, which is very important, really good, important conversations. However, I've always come to look at it slightly differently than other people. And, and you don't have to agree with me. I, I'm completely okay with that, but here's what I think. It's true that science and faith has had a complicated relationship, and uh, there have been some parts of our history as a church where we've pushed science away, and some parts of our church in which we've actually funded science and, and encouraged people to explore their vocation to serve God in the sciences. It's not been an exactly uh, uh, easy relationship. And that debate between science and faith sometimes makes really good friends into enemies. And I completely understand the depth of emotion that some people have toward a particular view of creation or a particular view of evolution. And I understand that it's a real passionate argument for some people. But if I'm completely honest, for me, I had to say it's just not that big of a deal. And I blame Mrs. Polk. Now, if you don't know Mrs. Polk, you have missed on knowing a great person. Mrs. Polk was my ninth grade biology teacher. Now, what I think about God and faith and science has a lot to do with what she taught me. Now, Mrs. Polk was a very good Southern Baptist. You know the kind, right? Never smokes, never dances, um, never plays cards, doesn't hang out with people who do, right? Ms. Polk went to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. She read her Bible every day. And whenever she would teach us about some sort of scientific concept, some sort of biological reality, at the end of this unit, she would always do this thing. She would kind of smile and point upwards and say, God's a smart, smart man. I love it. God is so smart. That was her way of witnessing. Now, I don't exactly know if that was legal or if she could get away with it these days, but for her, understanding the miraculous nature of science and biology and life, that amplified her faith in a God who created everything. It didn't diminish it. She saw no conflict between understanding that life is understandable through the scientific method, but that life also is a gift from God. And so, it's never been a big deal for me. Now, I love Star Trek and dinosaurs and can't imagine a world without them. But also, from the very beginning, have believed that when I look out on creation, I see the handiwork of God. And whether God did it in six days, six years, or 600,000, doesn't change the fact that I believe in the Almighty Father who made heaven and earth. But if that doesn't do it for you, I'm more than willing to get a cup of coffee with you anytime and talk about it more. Because that's the thing about our creed. It's an invitation into a conversation. It's a statement of faith, yes, but it's also a statement of what our faith is going to do in our life. Because here's the thing, even if we're in a debate about how God created, I think it's great for us to believe that God has indeed created everything. Because here's the thing, if the Almighty God, the Father of all, has indeed made everyone, that means everyone we meet is a creation of God. That person who cut you off in traffic last week, the child of God. The person who is next to you in line at the grocery store and is really, really, really making you mad. They're a child of God. The person on Facebook who posts different political views than you are have, they're a creation of God. And it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everybody, far from it. But when we begin to see everyone we encounter as a creation of the Almighty Father who made heaven and earth, then it really should change how we speak to each other, how we interact with each other, 
it should change how we treat the earth and the steward, uh, stewardship that we've been granted here. Because all of this is a gift. And our very lives are gifts. And when we gather together and make the statement that we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we're not making a scientific claim as much as we are making a claim about how we choose to live our life. We choose to live life in a world that is not random, a world that is not an accident, but a world that was created by a loving Father. And we are called to live our lives as a response to that. We're simply choosing to live with the humility that we are a small part of a much larger creation, a beautiful universe. And we're making the claim, as difficult as it is for us to admit, that we are not the center of the universe. The Father is. Our creed begins with a confession that God made everything. God made wheat to grow in fields and grapes to grow on vines that one day we might gather them in to set on a table and feast on bread and on a cup. God made donkeys and people so that one day a young woman and her husband-to-be could travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. God made a womb and human DNA that one day that same God would be born to us as one of us. God made all that there is because He's a loving Father. And I don't know exactly how it happened or how long it took or how long it will last. But I choose to live with this simple faith that I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth. Amen. Well now friends, as you go out, remember you go out into a world made by an Almighty Father. And so I hope you do walk in creation remembering the blessings of God. May you go forth and may the peace and love of Christ go with you.